Uh, this was um, around the time that the uh, pandemic restrictions eased and uh, staff, uh, professional service staff, academic staff were noticing that there was a lot of student disengagement and this was true on campus but as well as online engagement so at 1P we do a lot of work with student learning analytics and across the board both in person and online we found there was a lot of disengagement. Um, disengagement obviously has an impact on student outcomes, uh, retention and also a sort of sense of belonging. The reason we decided to look at belonging was partly to do with me getting a little bit annoyed that no one could define what belonging was to me so a lot of universities were saying like oh, we need to increase student belonging and I was like okay but can you tell me <laughs> what it is and then we can help you maybe increase it but no one could so part of this was that we wanted to define what belonging was and like how if someone says I feel like I belong here it's normally like an intangible kind of feeling you can't really pinpoint why so a lot of the research was to do with um like looking at what is it that makes students feel that they belong to university and therefore gives them better outcomes? Um, the research itself was quite expansive. Um, so we had 5,233 participants. Um, we had 244 diary entries, which were, um, we would give students prompts each month and they would send me a, it had to be a minimum of 250 words, um, but often they would write longer diary entries. Um, and I would read them <laughs> and analyze them and pull out the main themes. Um, alongside this, we also did um, quantitative data as well. Um, and that was, um, I think I've got some, I can show you some of that in, in the next slides. Um, we also did a staff survey as well. And that happened quite far down into the project because we sort of suddenly realized that if staff don't feel that they belong in their institutions, how can they help students feel that they belong? Um, and we had quite a wide range of demographics, including lots of different diverse institutions as well. It was really important to us that we didn't have a prescriptive model so that like Russell groups, post 92 small and specialist courses um, and colleges could uh, relate to the research as well. And um, so it was really big. We are carrying on the research in a more sort of like directed and specific point, but we, we just, given that the crisis, the engagement crisis was sort of national and like wasn't, it didn't seem to be impacting any particular type of institution more. We thought we'd look at like a wide range of demographics. Um, in this research, we've come up with a theory that belonging is um, when you when you satisfy all of these four main components uh, alongside adequate mental health support, students will feel a uh, higher range, <laughs> higher sense of belonging. Um, again, this is uh, this is a working theory based on our research. It's not um, it's not necessarily something we can. All, necessarily prove or disprove um, but it is based off of um, around 6,000 uh, participants both staff and students added together and um, so one of the one of the things we also looked at was this idea that um, a lot of students felt the sense of community at their course level compared to students who felt it at a university level so we looked at the course and we looked at uh, what best practices are happening at course level. We spoke to a lot of academics um, and we spoke to uh, people who are colleagues in the sector who are doing sort of innovative um, work at the minute around um, connecting students. Now, one thing that was really, really interesting was that a lot of the answers were linked around building friendships and peer connections, which sounds really straightforward, right? If you've got a good support group, um, you're going to feel like you belong more. Um, what is quite interesting is that actually the students weren't defining these connections as friendships. Now we got a lot of pushback from staff saying it's not our responsibility to, you know, foster friendships. Friendships happen organically. It's not something the institution can artificially engineer. Um, but actually, um, the students weren't actually looking for friendships. They were looking to be part of a learning community, which is a very different uh, concept. Um, and these are some really good quotes that we have here. So I think there was one quote. Uh, no, okay, didn't put the right there, was, there was one quote where they were saying like, they're not really my friends, but they're really important to me. Um, and but we, we also found as well that staff um, talk a lot about the burden on their time. Academic staff particularly get laid, like given a lot of kind of um, extra pastoral work that isn't necessary in their remit. Um, and staff were really worried that if they were given a remit to connect students, it would add to their workload. However, when we looked at the case studies and where 
this was being done in practice on campuses, what we found was that if there was a, there was a concerted effort at the beginning of the term to form a group, a learning community, um, and this is done really easily, it was through things like establishing a WhatsApp group for the course that the tutor then leaves, very important that the staff then leaves and the students have autonomy over it themselves, um, coffee mornings, anything like this, in the first couple of weeks, um, students would then autonomously run those groups themselves, um, so it actually, and then the students themselves would be able to answer questions around like uh, deadlines, uh, curriculum, things that they were confused about. They would go to each other rather than the tutor. Uh, um, so it, it not only did it actually lessen the burden on academics, it also uh, gave students a chance to be sort of like a mature group of scholars, um, each with their sort of respective e expertise, um, which is obviously what we, we want <laughs> for learners. Um, so we've got some recommendations here. Um, so one of the really important things we, we found was that all online in interactions students perceived as a way of hindering or harming their sense of belonging. So a really um, good example of this is that a lot of transgender students were saying that it was very difficult for them to change their name on the system. Um, and universities where they could change it very easily or they didn't necessarily have to sort of turn up on campus with a deed poll and a new passport um, obviously that in, that heightened their sense of belonging um, but also just having like the human aspect <laughs> of online interactions um, being told what the institution is up, to, is up to so students would respond really well to things like institutional strategy consultation updates um, and lots of sort of like feelings that they're part of the institution the institution wants them to know what's going on and they also value their opinion a lot so a really good example of this is with um commuter students were uh, uh, invited specifically to contribute to a strategy um meeting and obviously commuter students we know are very hard to like foster a sense of belonging in um and they said that that improved their sense of belonging um the accessibility of teaching and learning is also like a huge has a huge impact on students and mainly this comes to um being able to access your learning resources so when students face a barrier in access that damages their feelings of belonging it can encourage disengagement so for example um students with adhd were sometimes finding that resources weren't compatible with the devices they used or the software that they used um, and they would have to sort of go like an extra step to try and request that it's made compatible. Um, things like um, chart colours not being um, not being able to see if you're colour blind. Really, really difficult to understand these things, particularly if the if there's no one in the department that has that particular like disability. It can be quite difficult to put your self in the shoes of a student who would have access issues. It's not just around disability as well. There's a lot of comments around um, things like childcare. So um, going back to the disability one, um, making things always already accessible is one of the best things that you can do for students' sense of belonging. Um, the second is ensuring that academics are trained and equipped to upload the learning resources as soon as they can after the seminars. Um, so speaking about students with childcare responsibilities or chronic illnesses where they may not be able to turn go to the live seminar, having to wait several days for that seminar to be uploaded obviously impacts their sense of belonging, it impacts their academic confidence, it makes them feel like they haven't had as much time to familiar, familiarise themselves with the resources um, as their peers. Um, but really importantly, the staff need the support in doing this um, because we can't ever just assume that staff know how to do it. Um, so yeah, so staff will and readiness, again, we we found that all the staff we spoke to, there was a really um, like high interest in making their resources accessible, but there was a lot of um, concern, anxiety and confusion about how to do that. Um, I think there was also sometimes uh, staff would worry about um, making something accessible to one group and it becoming inaccessible to another. So for example, um, staff members who want to say that children are, or young children are welcome into their seminars with new parents um, would sometimes bring up concerns for students with neurodiversity who would get overstimulated with like loud noises or would get distracted um, by a sort of child. <laughs> um, so there's lots of conversations to be had around how we make things already accessible whilst acknowledging that some accessibility can um, impede on others. 
Um, and again, yeah, so like one of the issues of accessibility that came up over and over again, which is why students felt belonging at course level, but not university level, is because it wasn't consistent across the institution. So uh, one thing that was quite upsetting to a lot of students is, well, one student didn't understand why the Student Health Centre couldn't talk to the university and obviously things like GDPR concerns, et cetera, but that was never explained to the student um, and there wasn't any way to remedy this. So there wasn't any policy in place around data sharing. Um, so it's, it's <laughs> I, f I find this pro a lot of this project is about sort of like just nothing that we recommend is really radical like we, there's no kind of like complete restructure to the education sector but there are lots and lots of little tweaks that can be that we found um as examples of best practice um obviously we all work in universities and we know how big they are as institutions we know how how departments are very different i remember when i first started it uh in a strategy team and I, I, I couldn't understand why my department had to pay another department to do something when we're all part of the same institution um but students don't understand that particularly school leavers who have had all of their care support educational um resources all of this has been done under a sort of holistic banner um, they don't really understand that so again having that clear-cut communication with students explaining how the institution works really helps here um, in terms of inclusive content, um, I came into this and had my mind blown a little bit um, with inclusive content. So my assumption was that it was a case of, oh, students just want to see themselves represented in the text and that makes them feel nice, right? Like it's, oh, look, there's a, a non-binary person in my French text. Like that makes me, and actually it was not that at all. We had maybe three comments that uh, respect from the thousands of students that we spoke to, the vast majority of students were really serious about being able to go into a diverse workplace and perform to a high standard. So this was co common across different subjects, um, but came out predominantly in the sciences. So for example, medicine students were really concerned when they only had examples of Caucasian skin and they felt they would start to question the um, academic rigor of the course and say, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to perform in a clinical setting well, because I'm not gonna be able to diagnose half the patients I see because I haven't learned that, you know, what, what this condition looks like on their skin. Um, again, things like a student who studied uh, a world cinema course, it was called, and said that there was no Japanese cinema, Bollywood or Nollywood. And again, this impacts things like student satisfaction scores because they leave their course feeling as if they haven't actually learned the whole spectrum of a subject and that there were also comments around um, qu questioning the expertise of their um, academics as well, which obviously we don't want because we employ leading minds and students obviously <laughs> need to see that. Um, and free speech was also something that came up. And this, this is really interesting because it came up on all sides of the political spectrum. So obviously most of you will be aware that there is um, a kind of phoenix like re-rising of the culture wars at the minute <laughs> to say the least um particularly if anyone reads the times or the telegraph on a daily basis which for my sins i have to um but there's a real big thing around free speech and it's not just um one side or the other side of political spectrum it's all different sides um some students don't feel that they can question things like their module they don't feel that they can question the lecturer um it, so if you go back to the inclusivity, some students were like, this didn't represent X part of this discipline, but I don't think I can say that. Um, Right-wing students often felt that they couldn't express themselves more in student unions, actually. Um, and then the facilitation of discussion is something that interacts with the online provision of resources and online space. So where a where a educator may be really skilled in facilitating classroom discussion they may not have the skills to moderate an online discussion um and behavior is slightly different online as well which made some students who weren't necessarily that confident and um, feel that they couldn't interact or engage in the discussion at all um, so our recommendations are tra training on neurodiversity um training on inclusive design 
um, and presenting course content in global historical and colonial contexts. Um, where there are gaps in the content, um, we would encourage staff to be open about these and invite students to help close them. And the, the reason we say this is because when a student has identified a gap, they normally have some knowledge themselves that they can represent in the curriculum. Um, and actually, uh, we found that students that were invited to contribute to the curriculum. So, for example, a student on a um, Northern American module said, a Mexican student said, I love this module, but you haven't got any Mexican books and Mexico is in North America. You've only got um, books from the United States. Um, that student was invited to submit texts that they recommended. And obviously that student now feels that they belong more so to the, to the university than before because they were given an opportunity to uh, contribute to the functioning of, of that course. Um, obviously that's not to say that every course should like start out as not inclusive and let students uh, remedy that uh, to feel um, included, but it does speak to the power of allowing students as partners in, in, our, in our institution. Um, how am I doing for time? Uh, so quarter of an hour left. Okay, perfect. Um, so support is very similar to um, accessibility in that we are really um, encouraging institutions to make move support away from a deficit model and move it to something that is university wide. Um, it, it's not even if a student has their access needs rectified, if it's only them having their access needs rectified, that doesn't help them feel that they belong. It makes them feel that they are an outlier, they're someone who needs special help, that sort of thing. So having, you know, given dyslexic students a Grammarly pass doesn't help that dyslexic student gain their academic confidence. It doesn't help them feel that they belong. Making Grammarly accessible to entire institutions so students can, so any student who wants to use Grammarly can use it, that increases belonging. And it's also best practice as well because we know that not all of our students are coming from the UK, not all who, who you may be coming from countries that don't necessarily have special educational needs screenings. They may be coming from schools that have had their budgets cut around send students. Um, so you may have a lot of students who are dyslexic or have ADHD who've not got a diagnosis. And when institutions start putting up barriers to access and saying, you have to have this official diagnosis, it means, I, I mean, the most, um, I don't, obviously it's not, it's a horrible um, case, but we, I'm sure everyone's heard of the Natasha Abrahart case at Bristol, which is a very tragic suicide case where a girl had intense anxiety but before they allowed her to access um, her assessments online, rather than coming in, uh, the university sort of sent her around the houses to get an official anxiety diagnosis. Um, and unfortunately, it was taken so long that she did take her own life during that time. Now, if, if we had always accessible resources to any student, then that potentially could not have happened. Um, obviously, I can't say that for sure because I'm not a coroner, <laughs> um, but it was a very, very tragic case and it came up whilst we were doing this research, which um, was really heartbreaking uh, for everyone involved in this project to read about. Um, yeah, so again, a lot of staff are saying, you know, we're waiting for students to, to declare or we're waiting for students to fail before um, support kicks in. Um, and interventions around academic confidence, you know, they're located in WP schemes, they're not across, across the institution. Um, autonomy, again, this links to the inclusivity. So students who feel that they are empowered to act if they see opportunity to change, um, that increases their sense of belonging. So again, having like what I was saying about the North American module, um, having your suggestion implemented feels special and I'm confident about this course is really positioning the students as peers and co-producers co of knowledge that encourages them to be sort of like mature uh, scholars in this area. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing a lot of students are saying, I mean, so Gen Z move so fast. I don't know if anyone has uh, ever looked at TikTok, but like, the the trends are you get like micro trend trends right they're like three days long and then you're moving on to something else and 
I think back to when I was at university and if I wanted to talk about something, I had to go to like the weekly society meeting and talk about it. Whereas now things will happen on campus and immediately it's on Instagram, immediately it's on TikTok. And we can see examples of this happening through the spike in protests that happened uh, back in January 2020. No, back in January 2022, it's this year. Um, where students mobilise themselves very, very quickly around an issue um, and discussion and discourse around it happened very quickly. Now, a lot of, there was, I remember at the time, there was a little bit of communication disjunct between staff and students and institutions. And it was because students were having this completely different perspective because of the social media technology that they were using. And they were involved in, in conversations around the running of their institution and the culture of their institution that the institution wasn't necessarily aware of. So it's about meeting students where, where they're at. It's about um, learning from our students, um, whether that's what they're discussing, whether it's the platforms that they're discussing it on, um, really encouraging in them to sort of take a steer in the institution as well. Um, so yeah, increased opportunities for student co-creation to become standard practice. This is a recommendation, but this is also something that's seen as best practice from the quality and um, the QAA, quality agency. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Too many acronyms in this like sector, I swear. Um, and then a, yeah, a feed forward approach. So um, again, academic confidence can be broken or shattered with bad feedback. Um, we had a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews or focus groups where you get to see the um, the impact of bad feedback. Um, so encouraging students to have a uh, growth mindset and offering a variety of assessments across the curriculum, including uh, utilizing technology for assessment as well. Um, and again, as for the Natasha um, Abraham case, like this is something that could have really helped a student um, who who helped. Tragically didn't help. Um, so we have got some issues around the recommendations around implementing them. We do recognize that they're not straightforward. So uh, blurring the lines between the course and everything else. So students expect a holistic model of support when you know universities can have hundreds of different departments can be difficult. Again, mental health, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. None of us are psychological clinical practitioners. We use the term mental health because it's the term that students offered to us when discussing um, their mindsets. Um, but we, we haven't got the expertise or qualifications to be investigating whether it's mental health problems that impede engagement, whether engagement then creates isolation and mental health problems. But Again, this is something that we do need to be aware of. And cultural and systematic barriers. So um, is someone in a department that encourages innovation, that encourages um, the, the staff to, to find new ways of engaging students? Or are there sort of like, it's just how we've always done this attitudes? Um, oh, that's the end. Okay, well, I've got time for, uh, time for questions. Actually, yeah, thank you. Can we give Shirley one? So any questions from the group or any questions online? Um, question about the uh, idea of universal access and making things accessible by default. Um, since we're back on campus, you know, I've, I've got plenty of examples where academic colleagues are locking things down more, Great. such as access to lecture recordings, because they're anxious about students not coming to lectures. Yeah. How do we get that message across to our academic colleagues? Yeah, that's really difficult. It's a really good question, actually, because um, the other issue around that is academics and um, intellectual property and not wanting it to be sort of like uploaded online. Um, I think that there needs to be a lot of, there's a lot more awareness. So one of the things I get quite, as someone who's done this research, I get quite frustrated on is sometimes I will go on Twitter and someone will have taken a picture of an empty lecture theatre and they're like, don't ever complain to me about contact hours again. Um, and I'm sort of thinking like, okay, but absence doesn't mean disengagement. For example, one of the things, one of the issues we have with learning, student learner analytics was that students were meeting in groups. One of them was logging onto the system and downloading the documents. And then they were sort of like having a 
library session and interacting with each other and it was a really like highly engaged session but only one student looked as if they were engaged in that week and um, so there needs to be a sort of like this is why we had a qualitative aspect of the research like there needs to be like the story like the student view um, and that can come through student collaboration and student co-creation so encouraging academics to talk to student representatives like what is going on is it just that no one's turning up to the seminar because they're lazy or whatever the day may want to say to our students or is it because there's a cost of living crisis people are taking on more part-time hours is it that one student is downloading the, the resources and um, there's so much like like the symmetry that can be revealed once you actually understand what's going on and um, really encouraging academics to to think it's not always what it seems and um, when students are disengaging um but yeah it, it, i do agree that's it is an issue at the minute, I think, especially because there's a, uh, and which is why we talk about um, systematic and cultural barriers. Like one of the things that's fanning the flames of the sort of like frustration for academics is they're being told by their institution that they have to come in. So they're coming in, like getting on the tube, <laughs> exposing themselves to COVID, and they're sat in a room and no students coming in. And it's, it, that that would be a cultural issue right that's an issue with the department um so yeah there's none of this is a sort of panacea but yeah there's a lot of um uh conversations to be had with students to really understand what's going on i know that wasn't like a great answer but hopefully it sort of answered a little bit maybe yeah okay cool um yeah I have a question on from online uh what are the recommendations for developing a sense of belonging and community on the program um, to university-wide spectrum? On the university-wide spectrum. Um, so one of the things that, and this isn't an official recommendation, but something that came up a lot is the concept of like inter-faculty learning um, and like cross-campus learning. So there were definitely um, some suggestions around that. In terms of like a sense of belonging, it's not necessarily like the whole institution needs to sort of have a coffee morning with everyone from the university there so what when we talk about community we're not necessarily saying um it has to be like everyone goes to a big party it's a case of like the entire institution is aligned in creating the conditions for that student to do as well as they possibly can so when a student goes to their seminar and they've got a really engaged tutor who's like you know, they clued up on mental health, they know to ask for pronouns or, or they, you know, they understand childcare. What happens is we found that our participants would attribute that to luck and say like, oh, I'm just really lucky because my tutor uh, did this. And then they would go to like the um, student support services for like a disability and say the support services were like overrun they would say oh the support services have been no help at all but my tutor was great so we found that basically when when uh, students came to us and they had a very seamless uh experience where the level of support was consistent that would that would make them feel part of a wider community i understand that the language that we use around this can be slightly um confusing i think um i was the same as well because i um so I'm naturally quite an introverted person. So the idea of going to a coffee morning is like, I would never have done it at university. Um, but actually I do think that people want to be part of a learning community. They want, to be, they want to feel that no matter where they are in this community, everyone in the community is there to facilitate their success. Um, and at the moment that's not happening, probably because we have um, sort of high level senior leadership teams who create strategies that don't necessarily work with the frontline staff who are going to implement them. Um, and also governance boards are obviously very separate from the main university setting. So, I mean, I don't, I, I was on my university council as a student, as in like the governance board, because I, I was a student union president a, a while ago. And even I couldn't tell you everyone who's on that governance board. Um, so you sort of have these strategies that are designed and then not sort of fed down um, or staff want to implement them, but they don't know how they don't have the resources. Um, staff members higher up maybe don't understand the day to day demands of staff. They don't like there was a really good quote. I don't actually think I put it in here, but a start, there was a, a, an academic who said something like, you know, when I have to publish this many papers a year, I have to do this many conference conferences. 
I haven't got time to make students feel like they belong. Like I just don't. Um, so yeah, it's it's about sort of um, following that approach across the institution. Uh, more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, your point kind of carried off my question. Was there anything that came out in the survey about how to sort of increase staff belonging in their workplace? So this is something that we're working on at the minute. Um, and obviously we got funding to do the research of the student belonging. Um, but the biggest sort of threat to staff belonging at the moment is insecure job, job security, basically. Um, you know, staff not only are thinking about all the things they've got to do, but they're also thinking about the fact that their contract runs out in three months and what are they going to do afterwards. Um, we are starting to look at staff belonging at the minute. Um, actually, on the site this week, we've got a, a blog from a woman at the Bloomsbury Institute who contacted me after this report launched and said that she had done something called an academic saloon <laughs> um, and it, it had a very similar effect to community building so do have a look at the site this week because there's a whole sort of um overview of that work but yeah basically you, it's that really like cliche thing of you can't pour for an empty cup like throughout the throughout the report and um, if, if people want to read it like every single point is that this can only be done if staff are supported this can only be be done if um if they feel like yeah like that like they're trained and um competent to carry it out any other questions any more questions yeah um, so i've worked with fully online students for about the past five years online yeah fully okay, online. amazing i do find that their voice is missing yeah. from from studies not not just the study like quite lots of studies that have yeah. their especially over the pandemic sure um, but there's been some interesting literature that's emerged in the past years on mattering yeah. as opposed to belonging yeah. and i was wondering if you, if you found any if, were you able to identify were there fully online students in, in the cohort in sure the study? and if you found a difference we did a bit of work on inclusive teaching and learning last year and we very quickly dropped the phrase belonging but the students they just didn't like it and they're yeah. like i don't want to belong i just yeah. don't want to get my degree yeah, yeah. Um, but i want to know i'm, I'm valued and that i matter yeah this is like such an interest. So I actually saw uh, the Mattering presentation uh, online and um, I retweeted it and I was like, because I got a lot of people who do blogging on my, obviously follow me. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting angle. Um, and again, I think it's one of these um, like sort of my brain's gone dead. So I think it's one of these things around like language where um, to belong is so there were some people who were identifying like in order to belong you have to conform to the institution right I think that was a criticism I saw so this idea of like well in order to belong here you need to look like this speak like this act like this our our kind of use of the term belonging was that we wanted it to be that you're a student like which is why we have a lot of focus on students as like uh, co-producers of knowledge, co-producers of the curriculum, uh, things around, so for example, a, com a commuter student um, had issue of library times, they became part of like a sort of working group on improving accessibility to in-person resources for students who might be accessing resources at strange hours. Um, I, yeah, it was a really interesting one actually because there was part of me that was thinking, I have been thinking about this a lot since I saw it. I'm glad you asked the question because I was sort of thinking like, is it, if, if, if we have to sort of pre premise the definition of the word every single time we use it, like, is it worth using that word? Obviously this is the title we got the funding for, so we have to use that word. But um, yeah, it's, it's difficult because I think that, um, yeah, the idea of mattering is, 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 is a funny one. So what's that word, mattering and the feeling valued? Feeling valued, right, yeah. Um, I mean, this is just my perspective. We haven't run this past, like, student groups. Um, so for me, I think I ended up not being as, uh, like, not, like, still being satisfied with the word belonging because I think I was thinking, like, in, you can be valued and you can matter to an institution but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are an active agent within that institution. So you can be a consumer, like, you know, the customer's opinion matters, right? 
And whereas I think I saw belonging as a sort of like, you belong somewhere because you're actively contributing to that. Now that's just my perception. And that's based on like, you know, three decades of life experience as personal to me. And it could be very different to the students that you've spoken to. Um, and I think that, yeah, I, I would say that it's definitely not something that's like, there's no sector consensus on it at the minute. Um, it'd be interesting actually in the next stage of research, maybe to start talking to students about language, because I think that, is it, did they give you any like kind of, did they offer any explanation? Was it to do with being online or? No, they, they felt excluded by the word belonging. Yeah. Because they belonged to their families and they belonged to their communities. Okay. And they belonged, you know, 98% of them were in full-time work. They belonged yeah. to their workplaces. So they didn't want community. But they wanted to join a WhatsApp okay. group so, with their assignments. Very interesting. Were these mature students? Or? Mostly. Okay, so this is a fascinating, so I didn't include, okay, I'm so glad you brought this up because I can talk about it now. It wasn't part of the reason, wasn't part of this presentation, but um, one of the things around peer connections that we found was that um, when we spoke to mature students or online students and we were like, are you going to join a society? They'd be like, no, I don't want anything to do with student union because I'm, 36 whatever and we, I remember one student who was a she was married she had children and she was like I have a support network I have my spouse I have my family like, I don't want a support network but I do want to be part of a learning community and I do want to feel like I'm part of I'm part of what's shaping this curriculum she used that term but she she was saying basically she wants to belong to the academic side of it but her life is so she doesn't need to belong and I think sometimes with which is why I always say this isn't about like getting everyone together and singing and like you know that sort of thing and it's sometimes because I sometimes I find I find that this research is dismissed on like oh it's all just wishy-washy nice feelings stuff when actually there's like a lot of kind of like um pedagogical kind of like evidence that um feeling feeling like you can actively contribute to something is part of being, being valued um, and obviously does have impact on your student outcomes and that sort of thing so yeah it's definitely not um there's definitely no consensus it's definitely not perfect I think it's one of those things where everyone's sort of like looking at it just from like their use of words or their sort of like background and perspective but um yeah I've come across the matter ending actually I think someone <laughs> I think someone retweeted this with that and that's how I came across it and I was like oh interesting okay fair challenge <laughs> um but yeah does that answer your question or yeah, it does and I think that you drill down to learning community I think maybe to drill down for me yeah drill down to look at that and how that's different for the first grammar mature student because when you think of community you often think that it's something that lasts a while yeah but for that student, our student cohort, you might be in a community for a module because then you might step off your program yeah. for a few months. That's so interesting. And you join another community. Yeah. So it can be quite different. That's really interesting, actually, the idea of perceiving community as like a longevity thing. Like, I think that's that's definitely something we haven't looked at yet. Thank you. That was a really interesting uh, point, actually. So.